Okay, I'm reading from Acts 2, 1 to 17. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly, a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now they were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard their own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they asked, Aren't all these who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in our native language? Parthians, Medes and Alamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they ask one another, what does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them and said, they've had too much wine. Then Peter stood up with the 11, raised his voice and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These people are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prof prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Just pray Thanks. for, for you, Heidi. Yeah. Father, thank you that um, you're the same yesterday, today, and forever. And what happened all those years ago at Pentecost is still happening today. Father, thank you that you pour out your Holy Spirit to resource us and to strengthen us mm. and to um, empower us, Father, to do the things that you've called us to do. And I thank you that you've done that so much in Heidi. Thank you that she's your spokesperson in government, in a community, in the church. And Father, I pray today that your Holy Spirit would just speak powerfully through her and uh, enrich us all and empower all of us, Father, mm -hmm. as we uh, wait on you on this Pentecost day. Amen. Yeah. Thank you, Ali. Um, that was really lovely um, reading that you did. Um, so today we are going to be wrapping up our Living Water series. Over the last few weeks, we've really taken the time to unpack this one story of Jesus' encounter with this woman by the well. And this one encounter changed the life of this woman and the lives of the community, um, of the people in the community around her. And we've learned over the last few weeks how we really need to receive the living water ourselves, how we need to be resourced by the Holy Spirit, be, um, spending time in silence and solitude so that we can know that God uh, loves us, that God knows us. And then we can then take the living water and see who else needs it and carry it out to our community. Today is Pentecost Sunday, and so we're going to be carrying on that theme around the Holy Spirit, empowering us for the purpose of taking God's love to every nation and every people. So Pentecost um, is a really significant moment in the life of the church. Um, for, uh, at Christmas time, we celebrate Emmanuel, God with us. And at Pentecost, we celebrate God in us. And often Pentecost is considered to be the birthday of the church. Um, and it really marks a turning point in God's interaction with his people. Up to this point, uh, the Holy Spirit was only given to specific people for a specific purpose, for a specific time. And at Pentecost, the Holy Spirit was poured out to all of Jesus' believers. Um, and so when we look at why is the turning point happening now, why is God changing how he's interacting with his people through the giving of his Holy Spirit? We need to look at uh, Matthew 28 in the Great Commission, where it says, Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you and surely I will be with you 
always to the very end of the age. And so Jesus gives this commission to his followers. And it's, he doesn't just give this commission and leaves them to get on with it. He actually has a plan to fully and supernaturally equip them to do this worldwide, ginormous, massive task. Um, and so in Acts 1, it says, Jesus tells his disciples to wait for the gift my father has promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Then they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, it is not for you to know the times or the dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And so Jesus' ministry depended on, depended on him being filled with the Holy Spirit at his baptism so that he could fulfill his mission. And now it's the turn of Jesus' disciples and his followers to be filled by the Holy Spirit as well, to enable us to do the mission that God has set for us to do. And so the Spirit comes on the disciples and in verses 2 to 4 it talks about how the Spirit comes in sound and in speech and in sight. It's big, it's bold, it's undeniable and with the, the, with the sheer sound of, the, of this violent wind blowing through this house it brings out lots of people onto the street to find out what is the commotion all about. And these people, they're not any ordinary people. Actually, it says in verse 5 that they are people from every nation under heaven. And well done to Ali for reading out all those complicated <laughs> place names. I'm not going to embarrass myself and even try that. Um, so I'm going to cheat and show you this map because I think this is a really helpful map to show you. All those places that Ali uh, read out in that reading, all those countries of the known world at the time um, converged to Jerusalem to celebrate the Feast of Pentecost. Um, and the Feast of Pentecost was a significant um, event, a festival in the Jewish calendar celebrating the harvest 50 days after the Passover um, and that's why it's called Pentecost because in Greek Pentecost means 50th and so there's this really amazing picture of the birth of the church of the giving of the Holy Spirit being poured out on all of these people in such a visual in such a, uh, a way that you can't miss it and it's being witnessed by all these people from different nations um, under heaven. And so for me, that's a real symbolic picture of the purpose for which the Holy Spirit was given, to empower us to be able to take the good news to every person, regardless of where they come from, regardless of where they live. And in a sense, living in London or living just outside of London, you know, we have that picture of lots of people living side by side. We have people from different cultures, backgrounds, um, nationalities, who all live side by side in our communities. But unfortunately, we live in a time and in a world where, so, where some people are considered to be less than, who are judged as less significant because of the colour of their skin. On Tuesday, on Tuesday will be the um, anniversary of the murder of, jo of George Floyd. And it was a moment that shocked the world as we all witnessed a white police officer extinguish the breath of a black man. And for people, for black people in the US um, and in this country as well, this was not a new or a unique incident, but it was a shocking and tragic culmination of a long history of structural injustice against people, um, against the people um, who have been considered um, and on the receiving end of racial injustice and structural racism for a long, long time. And that's why the cry, I can't breathe, became both a literal and a metaphoric cry of a people who'd been on the receiving end of racial injustice for such a long, long time. Um, the killing of George Floyd led to worldwide protests as people protested the injustice of his murder. But it also was an opportunity and a, a moment to express that black, black lives do matter. And it was really important that we supported this cry because black people have too often been considered to be of less worth, to not have equal importance. 
And this time last year, I remember Jody and Ian both preaching from this spot and acknowledging that the church for too long has been silent on these issues around racial injustice. And that instead of being, instead of being vocal about these things, the church has been behind um, and has not led the way. And I also feel like as a church in this country, um, being a church in Britain, that we also need to come to a place of repentance for the role that the church in this country has played in slavery and colonialism. And some people say, but that happened so long ago. But actually, the world that we live in today has been built off the back of empire, slavery and colonialism. And the legacy of all of that still lives on today. And it's not just historic, it's also recent as well. I watched a documentary, a panorama documentary last month, which exposed um, institutional racism within the Church of England. And I raise these not as things to point the finger, or, or, but, but really to say that we need to come to these issues with an attitude of humility and openness and being really willing to um, reflect on the complicity of the church, um, both the church as in our church, Restore, but also the wider church, the church that we're part of um, in this country and the role that this church, the church has played in sustaining and perpetuating um, racism and structural, raci structural racism. So as a person of colour, growing up in London and also now living in Loughton, I have experienced racist abuse and racism my whole life as a child, as a teenager and as an adult. And now I watch um, the, the heartbreak, I watch, now I watch my children also experience the same things as well. And I've really struggled over the years, I've really struggled um, with my own racial identity. Um, because of the racist abuse and comments um, that have been said to me over the years, for a long time I actually felt ashamed to be Chinese. And so I would often actually never say the word Chinese, and actually saying it now is making, a bit me, making me a bit emotional. I would try to avoid talking about um, anything that would make me stick out, that, that would alert people to the fact that I was Chinese. So I wouldn't talk about the Chinese food that we ate at home or the Chinese festivals that we celebrated. And when we were out in public, I would often wish that my parents wouldn't speak Chinese in public because it would then um, draw attention to the fact that we were outsiders, that we didn't belong in the society. And in hindsight, when I look back now, I feel like it sounds really silly. How could I hide the fact that I was Chinese? Because obviously you will see it the minute you look at me. But I think that I internalized the racism that I received. I believe the narrative that was told to me, which is that I, am, I have less worth because of my race. And that's some of the effects that racism can have. And you know, as the years have gone by, of course, I've learned to accept who I am. Um, because of my faith in Jesus, I've learned not just to accept it, but to embrace it and to celebrate it. And that Jesus has made me a Chinese person, born into a Chinese family, growing up in a white dominant society. And, um, and it's not something that goes away. Um, six years ago, we moved into Debden in Loughton. And um, one of my very first visits to the area was to look at the, just to walk around the local streets, just to kind of work out where I want to live, where we want to live in this area. And on one of my very early visits to Debden, um, I was walking around the streets near where I actually live now. And someone drove up to me, there's a group of people in a car, they drove up to me, they, they slowed down as they got next to me, they wound down their window and they shouted racist abuse at me. And, um, and, and that wasn't a unique incident for me either. Actually, over the last six years, me and my family have all experienced um, lots of different forms of racist abuse um, and racism towards us. Um, and when I tell people locally that this has happened to us, often I get a reaction of shock and surprise because they say, I didn't know that there was racist, racist people here. Or I didn't know there was racism in our local community. And I guess you wouldn't experience that if, you have, you know, if, you, if, you're, if you're a white person, if you're not a person of colour, because you don't experience racism as part of your life. And, you know, a lot of the things that I've shared, that these experiences that I've shared, they're, um, they're really difficult for me to share. Actually, when I, I found it really hard to prepare for this sermon this week um, because I knew that I was going to share some, things, some of these very personal experiences that I've had. Um, but, I want, but at the same time, I feel like even though these experiences are very personal to me, they're very painful, um, 
um, and they're a little bit difficult to talk about, I, I wanted to use this opportunity and the platform that's been given to me to share some of the, uh, to share some of the um, discrimination and the abuse and the marginalization that people of color have to deal with on a daily basis. Because even though I don't get racist abuse held at me every single day of my life, um, I do feel that sense of fear and anxiety whenever I go out. Whenever I walk locally, I feel like who's going to say something to me today? Who's going to point out to me that I am worth, worth, worth less than other people because of my race? And when we go out as a family, when there's five of us together, I feel even more self-conscious because I feel like we're going to draw even more attention to the fact that we are people of colour um, living in this community. Um, and and this, this dehumanisation that you feel from... Um, from from being a person of colour, it, it, it's, it's even worse when we think about institutional racism, when we think about racism on an institutional level, um, and that's a whole other level of social injustice that people have to contend with. And when the government issued its review into uh, racism and, and, dispa and disparity in March, actually it was really painful for people of colour and for people like myself and my friends, my, my black friends, to read that report, to see the denial and the downplaying of institutional racism in our country. And it's, hard, it's been a hard year for everyone. You know, we often talk about how it's been a hard year because of coronavirus, because of lockdown, because of job insecurity, economic uncertainty, uncertainty around schools and education and having children at home. But when you're a person of colour, you deal with all of that. And on top of that, you have to deal with racial injustice. And so when you watch the news, you see that people um, of um, certain ethnic minorities, black people, they're more at risk of dying from COVID than white people. And you see, for example, that um, race hate crime against people of Chinese appearance has gone up 300% related to coronavirus. And that black lives um, have been systematically considered to be worth less and the government denying that that even exists. And so these are the additional injustices and the, the things that we have to contend with as people of colour. Now, talking about race isn't easy. Um, it's not easy for a person of colour to talk about race because it's personal, because it's uh, painful, and often it can be tiring, especially when people deny your experiences or deny the validity of what you've gone through. Um, and, for, and, if, uh, and if you're a person who's not a person of colour, if you're a white person, hearing this stuff actually build, uh, build, leads to, raises a whole range of emotions from guilt, to shock, to denial, to confusion, um, all sorts of things. Um, but I think that if we are to be God's people on mission, empowered by the Holy Spirit, in, entrusted with this special task of sharing God's love with the world, then, then we have to find ways to talk about this. We have to find ways to listen to each other and to learn together. The good news of Jesus Christ is about salvation, but it's also about reconciliation and restoration, being right with God, being made right in our relationship with God and being right in our relationship with each other. And being in the kingdom of God for me is about wholeness and it's about being restored to the shalom of God, that wholeness of peace that transcends into every area of our lives. And so if our friends or our neighbours or our colleagues um, are made to feel less than or made to feel of less significance, then, th then this is an issue about mission. This is a gospel issue. So what can we do about all of this? So it's been one year since the murder of George Floyd. And even though the police officer who murdered him has now been convicted of murder, the issues haven't gone away. And I heard some black activists in the US say that George Floyd changed everything and changed nothing. And so we need to continue to fight racism, whether it's in the US, whether it's in the UK, whether it's on our doorsteps. So how can we respond as people who have been tasked to share God's love to all people from all nations, from all backgrounds um, and from all cultures? So first of all, we need to do more than just say we are not racist. We need to be anti-racists. 
And what that means is actively opposing policies and speech and attitudes that communicate that someone is worth less or valued less because of the colour of their skin. And it's not um, something that we can become straight away, becoming anti-racist immediately. Um, it's a journey, and I'm going on that journey myself. Um, but I just want to show you this diagram, which I think is really helpful um, about thinking about this. Don't worry about, there's loads of words on there, so just ignore all those words for now. But I just want you to see the kind of the zones uh, in this journey to becoming an anti-racist. So there's, so we start off in this fear zone, or, or, or maybe we better call it a comfort zone, where we might not even realise that race is a problem, that racism exists. And we might surround ourselves Ourselves, largely with people who look like ourselves. We think about who, we, uh, who our friendship circles are and, and who are in those friendship circles, who are our closest friends. And we might find that we are most comfortable with people who look more like ourselves. But we really need to break out of that comfort zone, that fear zone, and move towards a learning zone. And a learning zone is is pretty much what it says on the packet. You know, to, it's, a, it's where we need to actually start um, educating ourselves, um, to start listening to the experiences of other people, start trying to understand some of these issues that I've raised today, and start thinking about who can we, um, who can we um, be around that maybe doesn't look like um, ourselves. And then once, we, uh, once we've done that, then hopefully we can move into the growth zone where we actually can start taking action on some of these things, where we can start, for example, when we go to vote, we can look at the policies that different parties are offering and think about them through the lens of people of colour. We can oppose people that we, uh, we can challenge people who are expressing um, racist ideas or, or racist um, attitudes. Um, and we can start surrounding ourselves with quite a diverse um, group of people. People don't necessarily look and think like the way we do. And I just want to offer a couple of practical things that we can do in the learning zone and in the growth zone. So in the learning zone, um, it, it's about education, it's about learning, it's about listening. Um, so we can talk to our friends and family and colleagues and neighbours um, and asking them about their experiences, talking to them about what it's like to be a person of colour in this country. And, you know, it might lead to some interesting conversations, but at the same time, we might not know people um, to even ask or even have a depth of relationship to even be, even be able to ask and have those conversations. So I think, you know, being able to read is really important and reading books by black activists black authors it's a really good starting point to really try and understand these issues and I've got a couple of book recommendations that um, I'm going to ask the um, online host to just post up links to these books which I think are a really good starting point to start unpacking some of this issue and really learning um, a bit more um, and then I want to suggest as well a couple of events that are coming up on Tuesday to coincide with the anniversary of George Floyd's murder. Um, the first one is a, um, a multi-denominational event that I um, saw that's being organised by Chris Kandaya. The Road to Racial Justice, which is a, 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 a meeting to really discuss um, with high profile speakers to discuss where the church goes next with racial injustice. So that's one I'm going to hopefully be able to tune into. And then um, an event just taking place just before it is a commemoration service, a service of reflection to um, reflect on um, the anniversary of the murder of George Floyd being organised by churches together in Britain and Ireland. So that's also on the same evening at seven o'clock. And the online Online hosts will post up the uh, links to both of those meetings online as well. So do have a think about whether you can make one of those meetings. I think it'd be really interesting to engage with the wider church um, about and, and learn and, and have a th and, and reflect on what we can do as a church in response um, to this anniversary. And then um, in terms of the growth zone, thinking about actions, what, what, what can we do to take action to challenge racism um, in this country? And, um, uh, and, um, and the way we can do that is by walking in the opposite spirit, spirit of division and hatred. Um, and one way to do it is offer hospitality and welcome to people um, from different nations, um, people who are of different races and different cultures. And I'm really excited to be able to tell you about two really um, excited, uh, exciting networks that we will be getting involved with as Restore. So the first one is a network called Hong Kong Ready. 
Um, it's a new network that was only been, has only been established in the last couple of months, um, but it's been set up in response to a new visa programme that the UK government has set up to enable certain passport holders in Hong Kong to be able to live and work in the UK. And this is in response to a Chinese, um, uh, the Chinese government imposing a new law in Hong Kong, a security law, which seriously curtails civil liberties and freedoms in Hong Kong. And, that, and this security law is actually in contravention of uh, the handover agreement between uh, the UK and China um, at the time when Hong Kong was handed back to the Chinese government. So the Home Office are estimating that about 130,000 people will be coming over from Hong Kong um, using this special uh, migration scheme. And that will be the largest planned migration of people from outside of the EU to this country since the Windrush generation in the 1940s through to the 1970s. And the Windrush, and it's been really well documented how the Windrush generation, when they arrived here um, to this country, have faced um, um, racism and hostility in our communities because they, because because of their race. Um, and the Windrush generation not only experienced um, the racism when on arrival um, to this country, even though they came at the invitation of the British government and they were given British citizenship. Um, more recently, they were caught up in a in an institution institutionally racist policy of the Home Office, which meant that um, members of the Windrush generation um, lost access to public services, lost access to the NHS, um, they lost their jobs, um, and ultimately they were taken from their homes and deported out of this country. Um, and this, in, this injustice against the Windrush generation continues to this day. I was just seeing, reading a news article yesterday about how the um, compensation scheme for the Windrush generation is, 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 has, has been uh, mired in so many flaws and so many people still waiting for their compensation for being deported um, from this country. Um, and, that's certain, and, and a number of them have died while waiting for compensation. Um, and so there's even criticism about the way the compensation scheme is being administered, that it's actually also not taking into account the fact that um, the black community didn't want, don't want to give their details to the Home Office at this time because of the way they've been treated over the last four to five years. Um, and so there's a real sense that we need to do better. We need to do better than what we did with the Windrush generation, with this new planned migration from Hong Kong. Um, I've also mentioned earlier that uh, race hate crime against Southeast Asians and East Asians um, has shot through the roof, has gone up 300% during the coronavirus, not really helped by rhetoric around um, the Chinese flu and the yellow fever. Um, all of that has whipped up um, a sense of hatred towards people from Southeast Asia and East Asia. And there's been, high, uh, there's been well documented um, violent attacks um, on people in this country um, just because of the way that they look. And so in response to this big planned migration of people from Hong Kong and recognising there's a real risk that these people might face hostility in the communities that they end up with, um, Hong Kong Ready has been set up to create a network of churches that are willing and able and ready to be able to offer a warm welcome to Hong Kong families moving into our communities. So we've already registered Restore Community Church um, onto their website and what that means is that um, for people um, living in Hong Kong right now thinking about moving to this country, they can go on to that website, type in what town or postcode that they're going to live in the UK, um, and then the nearest Hong Kong Ready Church will come up for them to be um, contacted uh, and will be, the referral will be made to the local church. So we've already set up a smallish team of people who in Restore and across all the congregations who are really um, excited to be a part of uh, Restore Hong Kong Ready. Um, and we've set up a WhatsApp group so that when we get referrals, we can uh, use the WhatsApp group to find out who can be the person to help offer hospitality and welcome to a new family coming moving into our area. So if you're interested to find out more about that, please um, email the church and I believe the online host will be able to point some, put some um, links there to contact the church um, and it's not just people from Hong Kong actually globally um, 18 million people have had to flee their homes against their will because of war and conflict um, uh, 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 fleeing oppression and poverty um, and also as well as fleeing um, from the impact of climate change and environmental destruction 
And so um, we have, um, and so there are uh, asylum seekers and refugees who are moving into our communities, people who've had to flee their homes and looking for refuge in countries like the UK. Um, and they also are at risk of um, facing hostility in the communities that they get placed in, um, partly because of racism um, and also and xenophobia, but also because in recent years, and especially around the EU referendum and the Brexit things, that there's been a lot of xenophobia stirred up and the scapegoating of migrants, uh, refugees and asylum seekers. So we've also joined, a, we also in the process of joining a second network um, called Welcome Churches. And the idea behind Welcome Churches is very similar to the Hong Kong Ready idea, but to have churches that are ready to welcome um, new families moving to, into our areas um, who are refugees or asylum seekers. Um, because when you, these people have had to leave their homes against their will um, and seeking refuge in countries like ours. And we wanna make sure that rather than be faced with racism and xenophobia and hostility, we want to be able to welcome them with warm, with open arms. We want to be able to um, surround them with people who can connect them with the community, help them settle into a new area, introduce them to the local mother and toddlers group. Um, so um, so that, that, that being part of the Welcome Churches Network is a bit more involved because that needs to be set up as a local voluntary service that we provide to the community. Um, so we will need um, more coordination and resources around that um, to, in order to, to build up a network of referral agencies. Um, but we are, still, we are looking for a team of people to also be a part of the Welcome Churches um, network in Restore. Um, volunteers who'd be up for um, being part of that welcome team, as it were, to welcome people into our community who we know are at risk of facing uh, uh, ra racism in our communities. Um, and I think for me, I'm really excited about these two networks because both of these networks, to me, represent our commitment as a church to fight racism and xenophobia. And for me, they really capture the heart of who we are um, as Restore, recognising that you know, we need to extend welcome and hospitality to people as our, as, as our way to express that we want to walk, walk in the opposite direction of hatred and division. But for me, there's also a more fundamental um, thing going on here, that we are only able to offer welcome and hospitality ourselves because we ourselves were offered welcome and hospitality by God himself. When we were strangers and enemies of God, he came to us and he, took the, he made the first move and he offered us his welcome and his hospitality into his kingdom. And um, there's a really good verse, Ephesians 3, 17, I just wanted to read to you. It says, for through him, we have access to the Father by one spirit. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and members of his household, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. So yeah, so if you are um, interested in either Hong Kong Ready or welcome churches. We're planning to run that across all of our congregations. Um, please let the church know and we can put you down as someone who's expressing interest and we can take it further from there. So today, as we celebrate Pentecost, we celebrate the gift of the Holy Spirit given to us to empower us. And, and, and for me, it's not just about that the Holy Spirit was given to us, but for me, it's a question of for what purpose has the Holy Spirit been given to us? And the purpose is to empower us and to enable us to go out to every people, regardless of where they come from, the color of their skin, um, and be able to carry and bring the good news um, and the love of Jesus to, the, to, to, to people, regardless of where they come from and the color of their skin. So um, I'm just gonna invite the worship team to come back and I'm gonna say a prayer just to respond to that. Thank you, Lord God, that you value each of us, Lord, regardless of our outward appearance, regardless of what we look like, or regardless of the colour of our skin. Thank you, Lord God, that you are a God of justice. And we just really want to um, commit to you, Lord, 
the world that we live in right now and the state of the world and the state of our societies that we live in, Lord, where we see so much hatred and division and racism. And we just really want to say, Lord God, that we long to seek your heart on these issues. We long to um, understand your heart for people, um, regardless of whatever they look like and where they're from. And we pray, Father, that you would, we pray for humility, Lord, to reflect um, on our own thoughts and attitudes and our own role in all of this. And we also pray for um, the courage and the boldness to be able to take steps in the direction of justice. Thank you, Lord, for the gift of your Holy Spirit. Thank you, Lord, that we do none of this on our own, on our own strength, in our own, in our own power, Lord God, but we do it in your power. We do it through supernatural power. And we just pray that you would continue to fill us with your Holy Spirit, that you would continue to lead us by your Holy Spirit, and that we would continue to walk in your Holy Spirit. In your name we pray. Amen.